Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wine.com Experiences. I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are taking a tour of France uh, through wine, of course. Um, of course, France is one of the most historic, well-known, well-regarded producers of wine. We will be specifically looking at the regions of Alsace, Burgundy, and Bordeaux. So very excited about this. It is definitely uh, a tour here with three very unique styles and places. So um, if you have these wines, if you've purchased them from wine.com ahead of time, please go ahead and get them open, pour them each in um, a glass uh, so you can taste along with us. If you don't, that's also fine. We will have um, this video live on on our wine.com YouTube channel, so you'll always come back and taste with us. The wines that we are tasting in order tonight are the Pierre Spar Pinot Blanc, the Joseph Duhan Choy Le Bon, and Chateau Marceau from Bordeaux. So very excited. These are all wonderful, incredible wines. And of course, as always, we have very special guests to talk about these wines. Um, so joining us today from Pierre Spar Winery, we have vineyard manager, Eline George. Bonjour, bienvenue. Uh, we, also have, we, we also have um, Veronique Drouin, um, representing Joseph Johan. So, bien Bonjour. Bien Veronique, merci, merci beaucoup merci. For, for your time. And Mathieu Chadronnier from uh, Chateau Marceau, the owner there. Mathieu, bienvenue. Merci. merci. Hi, Gwen. Yes, I see. know a couple of you are up a little bit late to join us, so appreciate your time and your energy. And very excited to taste these wines, although I will admit I have been sipping on <laughs> right before we logged it they're just all fantastic and gorgeous so i want to just just jump right into tasting and talking about uh these regions because there's so much rich history and uh both with the land and these wineries so we are going to start in alsace with you ellen um again uh thank you so much for being here and um taking the time to speak with us i i love alsace i remember learning about it first in history class because it's went uh, to France and then Germany and then France and then it just kept going back. And very luckily it ended up back in, in France where it's producing these wonderful wines. Um, you know, you have that Vosges mountain range and it's just an ideal climate for grapes. And of course you're known for the dry white grapes that you grow. And I know there's red and I know there's some sweet and there's some sparkling, but the dry whites are what makes Alsace so special. And we are tasting today one of my favorite varieties, um, and I think just terribly underappreciated great varieties is Pinot Blanc. So Pierre Spar Pinot Blanc um, from Pierre Spar. Ellen, could you talk a little bit about Pierre Spar as a winery and its kind of uh, vision in uh, its production, wines it makes? Yes, of course. Um, so first, thank you for the invitation. It's really, it's really, I'm really happy to, to present uh, um, the Maison Pierre Spar today. So um, on this uh, picture, you can, um, you can see um, the, the office of uh, Maison Pierre Spar. So this, um, the, the Spar wineries uh, was founded in uh, 1680 uh, by Jean Spar in Sigolstein. It's a really adorable village uh, next to Colmar. So I can I can locate it in the in, on the map um, just here. So it's it's in the middle of um, the center Alsace, and um, so it, it's um, for, it was first a really fa familial uh, vineyard, and um, in the 90s um, Charles uh, Spar decided to uh, diversify the vineyard in um, trading grapes in uh, the whole Alsace uh, region. So um, like this, we have um, a, a really um, a lot of different terroir. Um, so um, nowadays, um, the, the, the Maison Pierre Spar um, is located in Beblenheim, but we still have um, the vineyards in, uh, in Sigolsheim the, the old vineyards, if we can say this. And uh, we have also, um, we, we, we buy um, grapes from Marlenheim. So it's really at the top of 
Alsace region mm -hmm. um, to, um, to Pfaffenheim. So the difference uh, between um, the, the Marlenheim and Pfaffenheim, so Marlenheim is really a cool climate mm -hmm. and um, Pfaffenheim is more hot climate. So it's, it's um, the difference between the north and the south in Alsace. Um, and, and the Pinot Blanc grapes come from each coming through? Yes, yes okay. exactly. It's really coming from um, a, a little part of the, the north in Blinchwiller and um, the biggest part from uh, Sigolstein, so the, the oldest uh, vineyard, and uh, Pfaffenheim, a little one. Well, yes, it's, it's really a, a blend of yeah. the different terroir that we have. Um, so it's it's um, in uh, the house um, Maison Spar. We we really try to to play with uh, our uh, terroir. We are really um, uh, working on the selection on the of the varieties and uh, on the soil. Mm -hmm. um, it's this work uh, really begin um, the five last years. Uh, with a uh, soil selection um, like clay, limestone, and as well granite, um, and all, all the geology particularities in Alsace. So um, it, it's really um, my job, if we can say, to, to go in the vineyard uh, with all the, the wine growers um, to see different uh, soil, the subsoil, and all the um, historical geology of the region. And I was going to ask just what changes have happened at Spar, maybe in the vineyard or with the soils over, maybe over the past um, yes. two decades, you know, two decades, 20 years or so. Have you seen any changes or trying toward different methods? So the really the, the for me the, the biggest change is uh, really uh, we, we pass from uh, the village terroir mm -hmm. to the soil terroir. Um, before we were thinking that uh, in the um, same village we have um, the same qualities but um, with a lot of research and uh, soil studies we discovered that um, it's, it's more um, an effect of the soil and not of the village. Um, and in, in, the, in Alsace region, you have really a, a lot of mosaic soil, uh, mm -hmm. thanks to the, the Vosges hills um, and the, the, the seismic um, activity. So you, you can, in, in for example, in five meters, you can find um, five different types of soil. So it's, um, it, it's, it's really a, a lot of um, different types yes. uh, in wines as well. You, you, you find it in wines. And that, I love this. This, this, makes, this makes so much sense too. And, and maybe <laughs> our, our next guest can speak to that a little bit because I know in, in France, things are, in all of Europe, it's so much about region that has been already decided yes. and and how how much does the soil differ so so that's um that's really interesting that's great and and like i said we are tasting pinot blanc how would you describe to someone an alsatian pinot blanc so for me really a typical alsatian pinot blanc is on fruit you you have to 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 smell uh flesh fruits um, and as well, you, 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 you have to taste generosity, like the Alsatian gastronomy, <laughs> fortunately. <Yeah. laughs> and yes, you, you have to, to, to find for me, uh, Pinot Blanc is um, really representative of the character um, of Alsatian people, really mm -hmm. generous. And, um, and um, yeah, you have, um, so the, the, at the nose, really a lot of fruity aromas. Mm -hmm. And next at the taste, you, you have to find freshness at the beginning and after uh, a, a kind of, um, of um, 
roundness. Yeah. Well, that's, do you have the, I don't know if you have the wine, but I'm going to taste while you, yes. while you do. So we can talk through this specific wine as you say that, because it, I love this. It has the orchard fruits, we like to say, which are the, the flesh, the, um, mm -hmm. the peach and the nectarine, and then the floral, there's that white blossom and, um, and then, oh, I, yes, I love the palette. But go ahead and work us through this wine. Exactly. So first on the Pinot Blanc, you, you, you can see um, a lot of green reflects. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really typical of the Pinot Blanc because it's, um, it, it's representative of the, the freshness of the wine, of the youth um, wine. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the really, for me, the first aromas that you smell on this wine, for example, it's, it's the pear. You you yeah. really have the, the pear and the white peach. Mm -hmm. So it, you 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 have you have to taste it. You have to really to to because you you really smell the fruit. And it, for me, it's really um it's it's really typical of Pinot Blanc. This yeah. one. It, if you have a, a Pinot Blanc without aromas, it's really not a, a Pinot Blanc. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I love Pinot Blanc. I love it from Alsace. I think it represents it well. And um, this is just such a pretty wine. And it's wonderfully food friendly. And like you said, the food in Alsace is generous. There's yeah. the, the sausage, there's just a lot of flavor. And this yeah. is a wine that I think can go well with a lot of flavor. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, so this is very pretty. And also what you said is I, I have not been to Alsace. I, it's on my list, but I, I have had friends and they have said that the Alsatian people are some of the kindest, most welcoming people yes. they've ever met. So You have to come, you have I, to come. <laughs> when we're visiting things again, it will be wonderful. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I, I love this winery. I'm a big fan of this wine, so um, thank you. And thank you. Okay, so we're going to move over to Burgundy, Burgon. Um, Veronique, um, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, it's lovely to see you again. Um, so, Duran has a pretty rich history as well, uh, Joseph Duran. So, maybe if you could speak a little bit, maybe not to the entire history, but a little bit about the vision back. Um, it was from your great grandfather, correct? Yes. It's great grandfather yeah. and maybe about the, the mission and kind of the vision and how that's maybe changed over time, how that's grown, how you've watched that. Yes. So Joseph was my great grandfather who started the company in 1880. So 100 years later than uh, Pierre Spar. So we are kind of young compared to them. But nevertheless, he had the good idea to come from Chablis. So he was from the region of Chablis. So he was from Burgundy, but he came to Bonn. He was 24 years old and had no, not, the family was not in the wine business. And he uh, started to buy grapes and make wine. And then he passed away in 1918. And, and the man you see on that picture is my grandfather, Maurice Drouin, who takes over from, from his father. And it's Maurice really who, who um, put the vision on the company and started the estate. So Maurice uh, loved the idea of making wine, not just buying grapes. And he, you have to remember back, back then, he's, the company still is where he, Joseph started in Bonn, that little town of Bonn, in the very center of Bonn. And he needed a home to make his little business. So he bought a house and under, under the house, there was a cellar. Well, today people expect Drouin to be like a big uh, place. No, it's still the same place. Uh, so when you come, I like to show people and say, this is Joseph Drouin International Headquarters, and it's just a home. <laughs> and below, it's quite fun, because below you, you have all these cellars, but you have no idea when you walk in the city of Bonn. So Joseph um, uh, Maurice takes over, but he wants to buy some vineyards. But back then, how do you go to the vineyards is with the horse. So you couldn't own a vineyard like Chambol Musigny was way too far, because he had to go to the vineyard and be back. So he looked around the city of Bonn, in a reasonable distance, and his favorite wine was Claude Dimouche. So that is the beginning of the estate. He bought a little bit of um, vineyards. He was able to buy some vineyards. And then, of course, there was um, the war, two wars. 
um, but he continues to to take care of that little business and it's expanding. Maurice spoke very good English. He was the liaison officer to General MacArthur. He started to sell his wine in the US. He also was the president of the Hospice de Bourne. So he had many, many hats. And there's a lot of history, but my grandfather is quite interesting for those who like history uh, uh, in general, but in Burgundy, of course, in particular. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's actually a great book called Wine and War. It's not just about Burgundy. I've, not... I've read it. And you read it? Champagne and War, both excellent books. Yeah, it's a great, it's a really good book written by an American couple, but they did a great job. And so in 57, Maurice has a stroke. So he's left uh, half paralyzed. And that's when my father steps in. And he was also very young, 24. It's like the age at Rouen is 24. I joined at 24. Maurice took over. He was 24. And, and I don't know why, but anyway. And so my father is the one who really expanded and he was lucky that he could expand the estate. So he, he was able to buy a lot of fantastic vineyards like Musigny, Claude Rougeau, uh, Chambertin, Claude Bess, Bonnemar, et cetera. Today it's very complicated to buy them, but that, the estate expanded a lot in Côte d'Or and in Chablis. He was visionary. Uh, I would say he was visionary with two things, my father, with, uh, with uh, Chablis. In the late 60s, Chablis was not a very... Uh, good. Uh, the region was in bad shape because of the war, because of the situation. But uh, and then Oregon, uh, Oregon a bit later, um, much later in '87. But still, it was visionary 30 years ago. And then my father married my lovely mother, who nobody really knows about her, but she's fantastic and has helped me in Oregon every vintage since the beginning. And I have three brothers. So that picture we saw, I am with my uh, brothers. So Philippe is the vineyard manager. Laurent lives in the US and he takes care of the market. I, I am the winemaker. I, I have to say we are three winemakers working together and Jérôme is the head winemaker because I have a lot of duties here in Oregon too. Um, but anyway, voila. And Frédéric is the uh, is the big big boss. He's the, we say the grand fromage. He manages the... <laughs> And, uh, and then the very exciting news is actually officially next Monday, my oldest uh, child, Lauren, She's known for her wine in Oregon, but I love that wine. I love her wine. <laughs> Thank you. She's joining the family, so she did uh, business school and then the Lycée Viticole in Burgundy to learn about grape growing winemaking. She was a student for two years with us, but she officially will join the the family on Monday next week. So it's, it's wow, fantastic. Yes. Fabulous. Um, so I uh, so yes, you uh, and I have been a family business, which which we love the, the Druhan. I wondered if you could speak a little bit also to the um, sustainable and organic efforts, because I think that's something um, we're speaking about in Burgundy. Yes, so Philippe is the one who really drew, and he, uh, Philippe joined in 87, and he did same as Lorraine, business school, and then my father said, you know, Philippe, you will run a company that grows grapes and makes wine. You should learn about that, and he did. But in the end, after the two years of learning that, he came to my father and said, you know, I don't really want to run the company where my youngest brother was very excited to do that. But he said, I would love to be in charge of the, of the vineyards. He developed a huge passion for grape growing. And he said, but I would like to propose something as is that we go to organic farming. And it was not at, at no risk. Uh, the risk was to lose crop, to um, didn't know so much. So, and Philip is very smart. So he, he didn't go like in out of the blue, decided to do organic farming. Farming. So he really was, it's the same time, Dominique Lafont, Aubert de Vilaine, and Claude Lefleve, Frédéric Lafarge, these people were interested in a different farming uh, without compromising the, the quality of the fruit. And there was, yeah, there were some um, issues, like we did lose a little bit of crop, uh, just because the vines yield less, but we gained, I think we gained on expression of terroir. So really, Philippe has been the leader into that. And he went even further because we also now totally, we are organically certified, but we are biodynamically farming the vines. Oh, so okay. that has been uh, for a long time because since 88 is when he turned the entire estate to organic farming. Yeah. And I know all the wines we're tasting are, are absolutely at least sustainable and are doing wonderful things in the vineyards, which can be hard in France. There's just more, uh, uh, you know, climate differentiation, that might not be the right word, but, but I guess vintage variations. I mean, there's just a lot more climactic stress, if you will, yes. to make that always possible. So it, it's a little bit more difficult than somewhere like Washington State, where everything's uh, a desert and it's easy. So 
Um, yeah, but I have to admit that with global warming, it's actually a little, I think for my father, the 60s and 70s would have been very difficult. Yeah. But I have to recognize that our generation since the 90s, really the vintages one after the other yeah. um, has been easier. It's been easier yeah. to farm the fruit. Yeah, I have to recognize so, that. So we are tasting the Chore Le Bon. Um, where are we in Burgundy? I don't, I don't know if we have a map map, but we have a great picture of a vineyard. And maybe you could, um, well, these are the wonderful vines and uh, near the, the city of Bon, but the, um, your beautiful, Color. Yes, so Chore les Bonnes is it's true. It's not um, so. What are the what are the the names? So we some people don't know how to pronounce. So it's Chore, like you say, shoot. It's Chore les Bonnes, not Corey. So right. I am always often the question. And Chore, 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 Chore les Bonnes. But you say you say it very well when they live. And the picture you can see is actually the village of Chore, and the, the road you can see on the left of the picture mm -hmm. is the famous Route Nationale 74. So that road goes from Saint-Tenay all the way to Dijon, and it is what usually uh, we would say separates the, the, the land, the agricultural land, to the vineyard. So the left side is where all the vineyards are, and then but you can see to the right there's also quite a lot of vineyards. Sometimes it's just Bourgogne Appellation, but in the case of Choret, because we are at the little valley between Savigny and Corton Charlemagne, and to the left, the, the top of that little hill, the hill you can see is Corton Charlemagne. That is the hill of Corton with the tiny village of Allos Corton. And a lot of the alluvions came down and, and spread a little bit over the valley. Same happened in Pomar, and the same happened in Gevray, where you have this cone going to the valley. So Choret is, it's true, it's not very well known for a couple of reasons. One of them, there's no Grand Cru and there's no Premier Cru in Chauray. Okay. We are in so, Côte de Nuit, right? So we're talking about the Côte de Bonne versus the Côte de Nuit, just for those since we don't have it on a map. We're in the Côte yes. de Nuit, yeah? We are in Côte de Bonne. We are five Côte minutes, Côte de Bonne. Okay. We are five minutes north of Bonne. So you leave okay. Bonne, you arrive in Chauray, and across from Chauray is Savigny le Bonne. And just next is La Dois Céline and Alos Corton. So this is a tiny, lovely little village. And so the vines for Chore les Bonnes are both on that right of the um, National 74, but also on the left. So it's mingled between some of the Savigny les Bonnes appellation. And it's a very nice wine to know because if you think of the Burgundy, is it's becoming famous and prices we know are going up. But wines like this actually are very stable because we are between Bourgogne and more famous Premier Cru or village, like if you take Chambol, Musigny, um, Volnay, or even Beaune. So Chore is, I call them these niche wines uh, because they are delicious, they will deliver a lot. And they, um, they may not last as long as a, a Gevray Chambertin. I mean, I don't know that 20 years is a good idea for Chore, but, but five to 10 years is no problem. And, or right now, which oh, right now, I am with you. I'm a big <laughs> yes, yeah. My grandfather used to say, better too too soon than too late. So <laughs> very true. So I wondered if we could maybe talk about, uh, to the wine as we taste it, maybe a little bit about the terroir there and and the, why it's why it's so uh, perfect for uh, Pinot Noir and and how that kind of is reflected in the glass. So the soil is classically, as in almost everywhere in Burgundy, uh, we have marl and limestone and a very uh, specific type of clay that depending on the village you are in makes a different wine. That is why Meursault, Puligny and Chassain mostly make Chardonnay because the type of clay is very unique there. And then you move more to the, to the north and you see more Pinot than Chardonnay being produced. And I would say Chauré is a little bit in between because you have the foot of Corton that does equally well, Corton or Corton Charlemagne. And so the type of the soil there will give you wine that, first it's a Pinot, so we spoke about the, the color for, with the land, the color, the beautiful uh, green hue. Well, mm -hmm. here you, you have the typical ruby. A Pinot Noir, normally you don't see through your glass. You, I mean, you do see through the glass. It's not yeah. very dark. It's a variety that doesn't throw a lot of color or texture. Mm -hmm. And that is the, you know, that's the typicity of, of the Pinot. So you, you do have this uh, ruby color. And then of the nose should be the classic uh, fragrance of Pinot Noir. When the wine is young, they're very fruity, but not only, you have a little bit of spice because we're close to Savigny-les-Bones, so a little spice may jump here. And of course, with a little more time, 
that moves to um, lovely secondary aromas and that's where the, the shape of the glass is important. You go more to a round, like the glass you have is perfect. Yeah. The Vert Ballon is so good because it enhances the, the mm -hmm. fragrance of the wine. I've had, I've had this open for about you know an hour and it's just, it's, beautiful. it's just beautiful. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> I did the same. I opened the Pinot Blanc and thank you very much for sending the wine and I apologize that it was too too short to uh, send the wine to uh, Hélène and, and Mathieu. Mathieu and Hélène, uh, we will try to fix that yeah. so you can try it. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, and the texture. This is Pinot. So on the texture, Pinot is uh, more on the Delicatesse. For me, the, the variety gives a lot of uh, subtlety, finesse, is not a lot of tannins, even though that doesn't mean the wine will not, will not age. Pinot doesn't um, give a lot of structure or tannins up front, but there's the, the balance of the wine and the finish of the wine tells you, oh, this wine has a future. Mm -hmm. And I really like uh, in the Choret, I like the, the balance of the fruit with the texture that is not too intense. And so when we make the wine, it's not something we try to do too much take uh, from, from the fruit because it will give what it will give you, a little bit of that spice from the uh, classic of the area. And it's a great wine for pairing, I think. Um, what, what would be your favorite? Because I do love this, but the acidity is so beautiful. It, it just wants some food also. It, so your... it would go with a lot of things. And, and one of the things that, uh, of course, classic dishes like lamb, and you can put a little bit of rosemary or um, herbs, because that will do well with the little spice of the wine. But something that I really like is also salmon, cooked salmon mm -hmm. with the pinot, because there's something nutty in the salmon that combines very well with the wine. So, and of course, the classic oeuf en meret, so the egg wine, the, the, the egg poach in red wine. And then, of course, cheese. It's, it's very nice with cheese because sometimes we think it's always good the red wine with cheese. I am more uh, a white wine person with cheese because I think there's less conflict on the palate. But Chore is, is one um, example of a, a Pinot that has a lot of delicacy that goes well with cheese. Absolutely, yes. I think that would be the one a, a red that I would absolutely choose to put with my cheese. So, so thank you. Um, before before we move on to Bordeaux, I did want to just mention you are in the wonderful um, uh, Domaine du Rhin in Oregon. Just going to show a quick photo of where you are um, making fantastic wine with your investment back in the '80s, like you said, of taking a risk to make other excellent Pinot Noir, and and we're glad to do. So, um, it's really a stunning place. Big fan of. All your hand wines, so um, beautiful. So thank you so much, Veronique. Merci. I appreciate Merci. your time and the delicious wine. So thank you. Um, we will move on next to Bordeaux, Chateau Marceau. Mathieu, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I feel like everyone knows Bordeaux um, and, and held, held in high regard. It's known as such a revered winemaking. Region in France, especially for the highly collectible and highly sought after wines, but Bordeaux is so much more than that. And I feel like you and kind of you're in that generation really championing, championing that that other side of Bordeaux. So can you tell us a little bit about where you're coming from here? Maybe how you, how you define Bordeaux, how you define your Bordeaux, as as um, you see here, you're over in the Côte de France, which is the further east here. Um, it's a, yeah, there you go, Chateau Marchand, or near saint million but in its own, own region. So tell us a little bit about your Bordeaux. Well, well thank you for, um, well, mentioning that there is such diversity in Bordeaux. Um, Bordeaux is, is a great region. We have the privilege in France of having old wine regions, such as Alsace, Burgundy, and Bordeaux. Um, Bordeaux counterintuitively may be the most misunderstood um, because uh, we all know uh, all the great names um, and I personally feel grateful for the existence of these great names because they are inspiration, um, they are aspiration to make better wines, uh, they, they give something to aspire to uh, but but Bordeaux is, is much more than this um, and, and there is um, well, there's the main road, the, the main roads, and 
then you can choose to be a bit more adventurous and go off the beaten tracks. And, and this is precisely where Marceau uh, is. If, if you come to Marceau, you will most likely come from Saint-Emilion. And we're pretty close to Saint-Emilion. We're only 20 minutes away. But as you make your way from Saint-Emilion to Marceau, you're actually going on an imperceptible journey. You're leaving behind you the one of the culminations of wine civilization, which is Saint-Emilion, uh, more than 2000 years of history, uh, magnificent small chateaus, manicured vineyards, everything is perfect. Uh, and as you make your way, progressively, imperceptibly, the landscape changes. Uh, you still have a lot of vines, but gradually you have more fields, prairies, and woodlands that appear in the landscape. And, and, and as you continue, uh, and well, that's, that's a picture of Marceau I like very much because it really captures where we are. Uh, as, as you continue, uh, suddenly you realize that you're in a different, to totally different area. You're in a place that is much more diverse, that is more rural. And when you get to Marceau, you get out of the car, the air is different. It's all about silence, birds, uh, wind in the trees. And, and you look around and all you have around you is our vines. And you have some pictures of them here and prairies and woods. And, and what you get is really a sense of remoteness, isolation. So we're only 20 minutes away yet we are extremely remote and isolated. You feel like the road ends there. Um, and and, uh, and it's a very special place. One of these places that give you the impression that they're lost in time. My grandparents were farmers 10 kilometers away from us. So it's kind of a coincidence, but they happen to be farmers 10 kilometers away. I'm pretty sure then when they were young, the landscape, the views at Marceau were exactly the same as they are today. Um, so what defines Marceau and some areas of Bordeaux is that is the fact that they are more remote, isolated, and protected. Um, and uh, about Marceau, what I... Uh, so, yeah, the one element that really defines it is it's remote. P people, when they get there, feel like they're very far away and much further away than they really are. Um, Marceau, um, I mean, I, I heard Veronique saying that Drouin was a very young family compared to Spar. I have to say, we're little babies. Uh, <laughs> because Marceau has been in my family for since 94 only. So basically, we are at the stage of learning to understand our terroir, our terroir uh, where Drouin was 100 years ago and where Piaspar was 200 years ago. So we, we, we really are little babies, but that stage of learning and understanding is, is really fascinating. My, my father purchased the estate in 94. He had a wine career, uh, but wanted to have a place of his own. And, and he went on a path uh, with initially, I mean, at the very start already, the ambition to make something uh, the best he could. Um, my wife, who's the winemaker at, my, at Marceau, uh, I'm just the husband of the winemaker, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> but my wife, who, who really is in charge, yeah. uh, has gradually stepped in in 2012 when my father decided that it was time for him to take a step back. And over a few years, she, she completely took over winemaking and we completely took over the estate a, a few years ago now. And, and the way I like to think about how we make wine at Marceau and, and our learning curve is... It's a creation process. When you want to create something, but you don't know exactly what your intention is, you're gonna throw on the table as many tools and ingredients as you can. And, and to, to, to just cover every possible option and, uh, and make sure that you do not miss out on any possibility. And as you understand it a bit more clearly the direction you want to take, you start to take pieces away. No, I don't need this, I don't need this. I don't need this. And um, th there's a famous French writer, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, who captured this process in one sentence, which is, perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. And, and this is exactly our trajectory at Marceau. And, and since Saint Laurence took over, we started to take away, to dial back on, on, on different aspects 
because we understood the the identity of the place better. Uh, I think even though I have known the place for a long time and her also, we began to love the place with a fresh eye even more and, and, and to have a clear vision of where we wanted to go with the wine. So yes, indeed, uh, trying to go to that, uh, along that route when suddenly you think, okay, there is nothing left to take. Um, Excuse me, no, I was going to say, I just, for the Franc region, saying right, Franc. Yes. Um, you know, it's one of the Cote de Bordeaux. Can you tell me a little bit about what differentiates it or what makes it special, the soil, climate? Okay. Terroir. Okay. Um, <coughs> so uh, Bordeaux is divided into two banks. We have the Garonne River flowing through the, city, the town of Bordeaux. There's the left bank. Left bank is the Medoc, Margot, Pauillac, Saint Estève, Saint Julien, and Pessac d'Union. And the right bank is Domingue, Saint Emilio, and Pavol. Uh, and historically, the regions that have developed the villages were those the most famous. And over time, uh, people started to go further inland uh, when we could use something other than a boat on the river and a horse to move around and to move the wine around. Um, so what defines the right bank is mostly two varieties, Merlot and Cabernet Franc, when the, uh, the left bank is mostly Cabernet Sauvignon. So right bank is Merlot, Cabernet Franc on limestone and clay. And in the surroundings of Saint-Emilion where we are, it is mostly limestone and clay. Uh, at Marceau, we're only clay. It just happens to be this way. Uh, and for that reason, we have only Merlot, even though uh, what we have discovered over time is that our Merlot doesn't really taste like Merlot. And I, I had this conversation with a friend who's in the wine trade a few months ago and said, it's kind of bizarre to suddenly realize that your Merlot doesn't taste like Merlot. He said, well, there's a reason to it. It tastes like, it tastes like Marceau. I said, okay, I, I like it. Because it, it, it does taste like, taste like the place. Okay, well uh, and, and Franc is a very small appellation, 500 hectares only. Um, and, and it's a very young appellation where growers started bottling their own wine only in the 80s. And, and Marceau one was one of the first estates bottling their own wine. And what is the percentage here from Merlot? It's 100%. It's 100% Merlot. Yes. Fantastic. Um, I love that because yes, this does not smell like Merlot that I'm used to, um, but it's beautiful. And again, we've been open for a while and just, um, but I, I do realize I bought your wine quite a few times. I'm still holding on to it because I felt this is such a fantastic value for, for what it is giving. So I, I, I've had these wines um, and uh, big fan. So Merci. talk us through tasting this and kind of what we are getting and this aroma and flavor and how that kind of represents where we're coming from and maybe your approach to the winemaking process as well or your wife's approach to the money. <laughs> I'm just the husband. Yeah. Uh, the, so what, if there was one characteristic to define Marceau above any other, I think it would be freshness. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the clay, uh, because we are further inland, um, we, we tend to be in a slightly later ripening region because we're just slightly cooler. And, and clay is the coolest soil type. Um, it, it has its own challenges, uh, but clay brings a lot of things. It brings intensity, structure, um, but freshness. And, and, and if there was one characteristic for Marceau, I think it would be freshness. Then yes, there is, because clay gives a lot of power to the wine, that, that there is structure and intensity, but the winemaking is Get, is focused on just one thing, it's the finesse of the tannins. We don't need to focus about extracting because we know that the structure will come through anyway. Uh, and we want it to come through as naturally and as transparently as possible. Uh, so really, uh, Anne Laurence, my wife, her guide is the finesse of the tannins. And as soon as she, she feels that she has achieved the, 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 the quality of tannin that she wants in the winemaking, she basically just stops everything. Yeah, and, and I, I get that, the freshness, because when I first drink it, I get the fruit and the bright acidity, and then just so subtly the tannins kind of 
creep in a little bit, but they just, they're just so subtle and just kind of layering in. It's just multi-dimensional wine and it's, um, yeah, like this, so. Yeah, it's, it's a wine uh, that has a lot of energy. It's hard to define what energy means in a wine, but it's a wine with true intensity. And when it ages, it ages a little bit. When you taste the young wine, for instance, the 2019, which we're still selling on Pimer, it's, it's, it's still resting in food and barrels at the moment. It, it's all about the purity, crystalline, almost saline fruit. As the wine ages, it, you have notes of uh, earthiness that come through it. And if you taste the Marceau, for instance, A15 or a, a 16 two very different vintages, but both will give you a sense of walking in the woods basically early October, like just now, because the, the, there, there is this impression of freshness, earthiness, and as the one ages, it just as if it connected you a bit more to the land. And what do you recommend for aging for this one? Well, remember we're babies, so we, we have we have we haven't you learned haven't yet. You're still learning. How, how long they can age, uh, but we tasted some 99s recently, which are beautiful. Um, so I, I totally agree with Veronique's grandfather. Too soon is much better than too late, uh, and, and 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 these wines are beautifully young. Uh, but I know for a fact that they age 20, 25, 30 years. Uh, it's just that we haven't aged them okay. that long yet. Okay. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing these. This is beautiful. Um, to finish off, I just have a quick kind of fun question. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at France. I think it's roughly the size of uh, the state of Texas for us. But the diversity that comes from France, I don't, I, I don't think people always realize how small of a country it is to have such diversity. And um, that always is so impressive. So other than your wine in your region, what is one of your favorite French wines to drink, Mathieu, since you're already with us? Well, I, have to con I must confess a fascination for the purity of Pinot Noir. I liken Pinot Noir and solo piano music. Uh, and to me, yeah, the, the, the greatest Pinot Noir in Burgundy are just like listening to Bach with Glenn Gould. And, and I, I, I really have a fascination. Fantastic. Hélène, can we ask you, if you are not drinking Alsace, where in France might you go? So I, I, I really enjoy uh, Saint-Emilion uh, okay. <laughs> because I, I, I studied in Bordeaux. So uh, I was like educated with Saint-Emilion. And it, for me, it's really good memories. You know, you, you have the taste, but you have also the memories. And uh, for example, a good, uh, uh, a good um, Cheval Blanc, for example, it's really, it's really the best. <laughs> Quite amazing, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, Veronique, I know you're in Oregon, but if you're not drinking uh, Burgundy. Oh, it's, it's a very difficult question, I have to say, <laughs> because, oh, it's, it's so hard I, to I, answer. I couldn't choose, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's like choosing uh, a cheese in France. They can't choose one cheese. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> you can give two answers, it's okay. But the, um, Maybe because of the distance, but I love wines from the Rhone because I think there's such diversity and they, um, yeah, I, I like a lot the wine from the Rhone, but but again, it's 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 a very difficult question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, well, thank you. Um, no, it is. It is. It's about the diversity of France, and you really could drink something every day and be completely different. It could match every food. It could match every occasion. So it could match every uh, price point that you have. So. Uh, there's so much to be had there. I thank you all. This was one of my favorite trios of wine, I think, that that we've done. And I appreciate all of you being here and your time and making such incredible wines and, um, and staying up late for those of you who did. If you have not at home already had a chance, we do have this trio on wine.com. It is, like I said, uh, one of my favorites. It's absolutely delicious. So thank you again. I hope everyone stays safe and well. And cheers. 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 Thank, Thank you, you. Gwendoline. Merci beaucoup. Cheers. Thank you, Mathieu, Hélène. Hélène. Thank you. Bonique. 
It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice, and now our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com. Seriously passionate about wine. Download our free app today.